first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, this talk has been very nice. But, and yeah, so I, I'm going to present a work that I've been doing. I'm a postdoc at, San, at UC Santa Barbara in the group of, of Cristina Marchetti. And I'll present a project that we've been working on these last few months that we found to be quite interesting. Um, which also means that a lot of it is work in progress. So um, I apologize in advance if some of my answers are either ambiguous or incomplete because there are some things that we still don't know much about. So the main bulk of this project is studying uh, binary mixtures of um, typically two species in which we will take one to be active and one to be passive. So one of the species will break a thermodynamic equilibrium in some way. And the first few slides are going to be an experimental motivation because I'll be presenting a theory project, but uh, it's all based on something that has been seen experimentally. And so this has been work done by Alex Tayar, who is a postdoc in Zvonimir Dodjik's group. Um, so it's very useful to me that he gave a talk in this series last week. And this is one of the two species, which is a bundle of microtubules that behave in terms of modeling um, as a two-dimensional active pneumatic, as an extensile one. So it's a solution of microtubules that try to support an extensile flow. And by doing so, it creates a spontaneous flow that creates um, defects, um, active turbulent if the stresses are high enough, and a lot of other very interesting phenomena that that he talked about, but for the point of view of modeling and for the point of view of the phenomena that we're going to try to model, it's a 2D active pneumatic, an extensile 2D active pneumatic. And this is one of the two species that we'll be considering being mixed with a passive one, that is uh, this one. So these are DNA nanostars, uh, so-called DNA nanostars, which are uh, molecules made of four strands of DNA set up in this way so that they have four tips. And the four tips have overhangs. So they have the ability to, if they come in contact, to uh, attach to each other through these overhangs. And so um, what we expect this to do, if, is, if we have a solution of these molecules, we expect them to phase separate. And so that's exactly what happens. So this is a microscope image of a solution of these DNA nanostars in which nothing has happened. There is no non-equilibrium phenomena here. And this time series at the bottom shows that, shows that if uh, time passes by, Clusters of these will just coalesce uh, through Oswald ripening and form at a, a late times a single big cluster of DNA nanostars. Um, we also are going to be looking at this uh, system in terms of critical phenomena. So this single solution of DNA nanostars has a phase diagram that should look very familiar to everybody, which is a usual uh, liquid gas phase separation phase diagram. So there is a coexistence region in which the system phase separates and we have a dilute at dense region and, there's, and dense regions. And as we increase the temperature, at some point we cross a critical temperature at which the coexistence densities get closer and closer together until they reach zero continuously because it's a continuous phase transition. And then above the critical temperature, we just see a uniform, um, a uniform state. Right, so these two species that I talked about are what's going to make our binary mixture. On one side, this, let's say, passive DNA nanostars that just try to phase separate. And on the other hand, the 2D active pneumatic. So this is just a sketch of how they should look like. So uh, these microtubules would, will create these spontaneous flows. And there's going to be a very active, let's say, turbulent flow around these uh, droplets or clusters of DNA um, of DNA nanostars. Now, in terms of experiments, these DNA nanostars are, a, are a, a viscoelastic fluid that remains quite stable. So we can tune an interaction between the two species by adding a third molecule called kinesin, which uh, has been sketched here, which has the ability to attach to both the overhangs of DNA nanostars and microtubules. So as microtubules move across the interface of a droplet, um, this kinesin might then attach to both of them and create kind of a pool. So uh, in dynamic terms, this will um, make a couple between the velocities of both species when there's a local density that consists of both DNA nanostars and microtubules. Um, and this creates a very interesting dynamic state, which is the one we see on the right, where this attachment uh, couples the flow of the DNA nanostars to the microtubules. And so it creates a, um, an active flow of DNA. 
whereas the one on the left would be a late uh, uh, um, a late time state of of a, of a system without kinesing where the DNA nanostars have phase separated. We have a dense region of DNA nanostars, and then the black region would be an active flow, uh, which is not seen here, but uh, it doesn't interact in any way with the DNA nanostars. And again, going back to critical phenomena, what, what we would find for the passive case without kinesin is what we saw before. So as we increase the temperature, these nanostars will at some point dissolve in the fluid and we will have a uniform state. But uh, the interesting thing is as we add kinesin, and this is one of the more robust results experimentally that we're going to try to see if we can model, is that this phase separation region changes quite a lot. So there is a suppression of phase separation, which is translated into the phase diagram by a, by a shift uh, downwards of the critical point. So we have to lower the system to much, we have to take the system to much lower temperatures to get phase separation again. Um, and um, intuitively what we see, what, what we would understand is that these local stresses in the interface are pulling DNA nanostars from the bulk and dissolving it in the fluid. So what we're going to try to model is these stresses and hopefully these interface stresses created by active flows will be enough to create, to not create, but to suppress phase separation. And so I'm going to follow, uh, I'm going to present two models basically in uh, increasing complexity. So what we try to do is see what a minimal, see what a minimal model we can build that has the suppression of phase separation uh, just to interface stresses. So the first thing, the simplest thing we can do is just define a single uh, density field phi here, which takes continuous values from say minus one to one. And we interpret each of the values to be either concentration of microtubules or concentration of DNA. So in this sketch here, which would be a state of, a state in which the system is phase separated, let's say the red means phi is minus one, blue is phi equals one, and we interpret minus one to be microtubules, we, we interpret um, one to be DNA. Uh, this would be the equation of motion where the right hand side is just the usual diffusive dynamics of a density field that has conserved mass. So it's the Laplacian of some chemical potential where A and B come from, a, all of them actually, they just come from a free energy, from a 5-4 free energy that uh, tries to phase separate where A, the parameter A, is the relevant parameter here and it's just a reduced temperature. And uh, uh, this is the usual double wall potential where for positive A, this free energy has a single minima. Uh, so the field phi, the, the steady state will be phi is zero everywhere, which corresponds in our model to a completely mixed system. And negative values of the reduced temperature create these two separate minima in the free energy, which points to a phase separated system, right? So we'll, the two species will try to phase separate. The second ingredient is the second term of the left-hand side, which is advection through a velocity field V. And through this velocity field, we have to write the, the interface stresses that we want to look uh, at the effect of. So the velocity field V corresponds to a Navier-Stokes equation. Um, there's nothing much special about it. It's a usual Navier-Stokes equation. And the last term in red here is the stress produced by density gradients. The nice thing about this very minimal model is that this can be done in equilibrium. And in equilibrium, these stresses given by a density gradient are just related to how much how much free energy we have to give the system to create a density gradient. So that will create a, a, a backflow that tries to mix it together again to say, so that's a very simple explanation, but for the particular case of a scalar field, which is phi here, this stress has this form here, uh, which just comes from technically looking at, I'm, I'm happy to tell someone in more detail how one get this, but it comes from technically looking at these changes of free energy uh, when you create a density gradient and it's related to density to uh, uh, gradient densities as we would expect. And this in the literature is called model H for those of you who want to, to read about it. So this points in the right direction because this tells us that a passive binary mixture will create stresses at the interface. And it's quite interesting to take this stress here, this sigma and interpret the gradient of a field. So a gradient of density as a director field because then this stress actually has the form of uh, a, a, a tensor that we will use to define a um, animatic order, order parameter, right? Um, so we can say, okay, we can interpret this stress to be the stress given by a tensor order parameter that is along the gradient of n. And then we can play around with the value of the prefactor here 
to, def to say whether the stress created by gradients of density are of contractile or extensile, um, of a contractile or extensile nature. So, and this is just playing with the sign of this, of this stress here. For negative values of kappa, we have extensile activity. So the interface, which is sketched in blue here, will try to support an extensile flow along it. And for positive values of kappa, the interface will try to support a contractile one. And uh, this particular system, which is just obtained by playing around with these values of, of the prefactor, is called active model H in the literature. It's been seen before as well. And it points us in the right direction because it's been shown that through purely dimensional analysis, an extensile activity um, creates a negative interface tension. So it breaks complete uh, full phase separation and this interface becomes unstable. So the interface of a full phase separated system will um, have an instability that breaks it into this di dynamic, very dynamic steady state. So what we will do with this system is, first of all, study, we'll try to get two things, which is one of them, how this interface uh, becomes unstable, what kickstarts this instability, which we expect to be, of course, the, the, the stress. And second, whether this is enough to suppress phase separation. So if the stresses are high enough, uh, or if activity is high enough through making this value of kappa high enough, is this stress enough to completely mix the system together? So to study the interface, what we can do is, um, and this becomes quite technical, so I won't go in a lot of detail, but again, I'm happy to, to, to get more in detail later if anybody wants to, but we can, what I try to sketch here is a 3D version of well, what we have on the left. So the system has been phase separated completely into, region, into species A and B. The surface in the middle is just the interface, which is the point at which the gradient of phi is greatest. Uh, we start with a flat interface and we look at perturbations of it through this function H. So H is just the height function of this, uh, of this initially flat surface. What we can do is now uh, take our field phi, assume that the interface is very thin by assuming that phi is a function F that we can take to be a step function of uh, y being here the coordinate that is perpendicular to, to the interface plus this initial perturbation over a flat interface. And then, and this is what's a bit technical, is just taking this and trying to linearize the equation of, of h uh, using the equations of motion that we started with. Uh, doing so, we obtained an effective, uh, well, a dynamic equation for h, which gives us an effective uh, interface tension. And this is what's interesting because this interface tension is actually quite simple. It's just a a, a polynomial with two terms that turns out to be uh, of these two different kinds. So for a contractile system, which again corresponding to positive values of kappa, this is always negative, meaning that any perturbation of the interface will die out. But as we initially thought and wanted to find, as we make the system extensile by using negative values of kappa, we obtain a range of wave vectors in Fourier space that make the interface unstable. So this is a good uh, initial point, and if we actually integrate numerically these equations for, a, for an extensile stress, we see that the interface develops this instability, and it just breaks it apart. Um, now, the second thing that we want to find out is whether this is enough to find the suppressed phase separation. So what we can do is just now play with the stress and try to look at the, at the, um, at the phase diagram. So just scan through different values of temperature and volume fraction and see what the system does. Um, the reason we wanted to do this is because if we simplify the system a lot by forgetting about the Navier-Stokes equation and imposing a global shear, um, and just for time, I'm going to go fast through this. Uh, this has been done in the literature before in the case of a very simple, just globe external imposed shear on a passive binary mixture. In this case, one can actually obtain analytically a, a shift of the critical temperature that is proportional to the, to the strength of the shear. So this is how the phase diagram would look like, which, uh, the upper curve is the coexistence region for the passive case where there's no shear. As we increase the shear, we can actually shift down the critical point as much as we want. However, the difference is that in our model, these, the, these local shears are given by these stresses, and these stresses depend on density gradients only because we wanted to look at the effect of stresses in the interface. So as activity, um, uh, so as the stresses start mixing the system, mixing means taking these densities closer to zero. So the stresses also, also uh, fall down, right? So at some point we can expect to have an interplay between stresses getting weak and the diffusive dynamics of phi trying to phase separate it, making gradients higher. And that's actually what happens. And if we scan 
numerically the space diagram with our model with these uh, non-equilibrium stresses, what we find is that uh, what we find is this, where the orange curve would be the coexistence region of uh, the passive case, no activity. And as we, if we make an extensile activity, we obtain the green one. So the coexistence densities change. They get closer to each other, meaning that there is some mixing. So these stresses are pulling some of the species into the bulk of the other, but the critical point itself doesn't change. And that's again, as I said, because as the system tries to get mixed by the, lo by the, by the local shears produced by the by the density gradients, those gradients go down, so the shears also go down. So this was enough to explain this interface instability, but it was not enough to explain this, this um, critical shift. So the next step is just to go to now uh, try to look at the microtubules explicitly. So instead of having this density gradients as a proxy for what the microtubules do at the interface, just go one step further and have a third field um, describing the full nematic. So this third field is a tensor Q, which is also the standard way to um, to model a, 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 a nematic order parameter. Um, and um, so it's advected by the same fluid. And its dynamics have these first two terms here, lambda and omega are a tumbling parameter. So the nematic will try to align with the fluid and it will be rotated by local, uh, by, by vorticity. And H here, capital H, is a molecular field that tries to create nematic order. Um, the red term here is the important one because now we have a second nematic on the fluid and this will create some extensile stress, which is exactly, now we can explicitly model the, the stress that these microtubules create in the fluid is going to be an extensile stress in the region where there is microtubules. So this extensile stress alpha has to be coupled to phi in a way that it sets activity to zero if we have a local density of only DNA nanostars. So if there's no microtubules, there's no activity. And again, this molecular field H will try to create nematic order through a temperature parameter only in one of the phases as well. So, um, so the system will try to, in equilibrium, if alpha is zero, the system will phase separate into microtubules DNA, and it will try to create nematic order in the region, in the phase of uh, phi that we interpret to be microtubules. So now with added complexity, what we have to do is just find uh, if this is enough now to find still both the instability in the interface that kickstarts this mixing, and then to see if there is um, a critical shift, a, a shift of the critical temperature. So to find the behavior of the interface, we can do the same thing. We can linearize uh, and look at what an initially, what a perturbation to an initially flat surface does. Now it's quite more complex because we have two things to look at. One is the height itself, and now we have a nematic order parameter, so we can look at what the angle is doing uh, close to the interface. So now instead of an equation of motion for the height, we have two coupled equations of motion for both height and director close to the interface. Um, they are coupled through a dynamic matrix M here, and Back to linear algebra, we can look at eigenvalues of M to see what the system is doing. So if M has negative real eigenvalues, that means that any perturbation will decay back to zero. Positive real instability and imaginary eigenvalues point to possible oscillatory modes. So looking at what this M does, which is obtained again by linearizing now these three equations, we find that as we would like to find and as we would expect for contractile stresses, the system remains stable, where the green and blue here are the uh, real eigenvalues. So any perturbation will decay and the system remains phase separated, even though there might be active flows in one of the phases. But as we take alpha to be negative and make the system extensile, we obtain two interesting things. First of all, we again see an instability, which is what we would expect. And we also see oscillatory modes. And this, uh, I'm just gonna throw it in there, but some of the people in the group are studying these oscillatory modes because they've also been seen experimentally by looking at phase separated systems that are not very extensive, also low stresses, and they find oscillating, uh, propagating waves along the interface, which are uh, in and of themselves quite quite interesting. But for the point of view of this critical phase separation, we expect these, um, these instabilities for low Qs to uh, kickstart this mixing process. That is exactly what happens, where this is now a simulation with a uh, full nematic order modeled in the system. So the system starts phase separated. We activate an extensile uh, stress along the interface, and then we have an instability that uh, creates this flow. 
Now, the interesting difference here is that now extent, uh, stresses depend on gradients of Q. So even if the system becomes fully mixed, there is still nematic order in the bulk. Um, so there are still, there can still be gradients of Q. So there can still be uh, uh, flows, even if the system is completely mixed, which is the problem we had before. And that is exactly what happens. So these are two simulations just to show what they do. Both of the simulations are at, at a temperature lower than the critical temperature. So if there was no activity, both of these systems would remain phase separated. But uh, the one on the right is at a slightly lower temperature. And this is just to show that now we can actually put the systems at, at temperature at which the passive system would phase separate. But we observe, um, but the pneumatic, the, the local shear flows created by the pneumatic are still strong enough in a mixed system to keep mixing the system. Um, so this is great. This is what, what has been seen experimentally. So it's what we expect to find. Um, I have a few minutes left. So if we, again, now try to just scan the phase diagram numerically to see what the critical point does, now we do find a shift um, for which we do not have a clear mechanism yet. Um, so this is part of the work in progress. And this data is also not, not that good yet. But here, uh, Vertical axis is temperature, reduced temperature. A horizontal axis is volume fraction. So this is the usual two parameters for, for this kind of uh, liquid gas phase transition. The purple line on the top is the coexistence region of the passive system. And um, this one is the one calculated, the, the green one is the one calculated numerically for this full system with a pneumatic, with an explicit pneumatic order uh, put into it. So now there is a clear, there is a clear shift. And if we look at the role of activity, uh, and this is also incomplete data, but we can look at how the difference in coexistence densities, which is for a given temperature, the width of this coexistence region changes as we change activity. If we do that, where here vertical axis is that difference of coexistence densities, horizontal axis is reduced temperature. So where these lines cross the horizontal axis points to the critical point of the system. And we can see that as we increase the activity and make it say more extensile we push that critical temperature into more uh, into lower and lower values so um if we try to sketch what uh the first phase diagram would look like if, if we plot it in three dimensions where a third dimension and this is my very bad hand-drawn sketch but hopefully it illustrates if we put a third dimension for activity then we that uh, critical point will fall more and more and the reason I like to show this is because Alex managed to get this phase diagram experimentally through uh, many months of work. And uh, it looks like this. We're here. Uh, vertical axis is temperature. Um, let's say one of the horizontal axis is volume fraction. And the other one is uh, uh, amount of kinesing, which regulates this stress interaction uh, at, the, at the interface between the two species. Um, OK, so I'm. Uh, almost done on time. So I think I'll uh, leave it there. Uh, I'll leave two comments about things that, as I said, this is work in progress, so we're still working on it. Uh, particularly what we're very interested in is to find a proper mechanism for this for this shift of the critical point. Um, there is an intuitive one through just looking at length scales of the system because we expect the system to have uh, two fundamental Time scales, time, uh, time scale in at which the, the local shears try to mix the fluid and a time scale at which the diffusive dynamics try to phase separate it again. So one could expect this uh, full mixing to be an interplay between those or maybe length scales of, of um, the, the typical vortex size of the active pneumatic, which could be the, the length scale at which the system is getting mixed and then a uh, length scale of, say, spinodal decomposition at which the, the field phi tries to phase separate. So uh, there is maybe some understanding to be looked at there. But, um, but yeah, this is this is uh, what we have so far. So I think I'm right on 25 minutes. So I'll leave with a couple of conclusions. And thank you to collaborators. So Christina, of course, who's been leading this project, and uh, Zvonimir and Alex for the very nice experimental work they've done on this. And i leave here my email in case anybody wants to get in touch. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Fernando, for a wonderful talk. So uh, we have some questions. So the first question is Jing from Jing Yan. And uh, they're asking, in the active case, 
what is the experimental criteria for phase separation versus non phase separation like you know not phase separated um as far as i know what alex does is i i think it's very clear experimentally because you either see a, a big difference in coexistence densities or a completely uniform system so um i wish i had videos of this because it looks super clear but the system just goes uniform mm -hmm. either goes completely uniform or you clearly see phase separated regions of dna droplets um I'm sorry, I don't have videos because it, it would be really clear, but it's just like, it's, it's just looking at the system and, and, and lo just looking at the coexistence densities mm -hmm. or lack of coexistence densities, yeah. All right, so the next question is from Rubine and uh, Rubine is asking, could you construct an equation of motion for the interface itself? Yeah, so um, that's what I do. Well, for the full system, that's what, where is it? That's what this is. So these two equations here, let me go you know, full screen. So this is an equation of motion for the interface itself. So, so this H is the height of the interface. Um, and this is a bit tricky to do technically. There are a few tricks to, 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 to use to get these two equations, but this is an equation for H being just the height. So it looks a bit like a KPZ type of equation, if you know that, or, and theta is the pneumatic director at the interface. So this is yeah. a full description of the interface. Yeah. I, I wanted to know what, what was the nature of the kinetic roughening? Uh, just like, is it belonging to the KPZ universality class? Uh, no, because uh, the KPZ universality class belongs to, is exactly what you would get if you do this calculation that I did here. Um, so if you do it with a single field phi that is not conserved, then you get exactly KPZ. So this uh, partial TH would be KPZ if you don't do it linearly, but get the first nonlinearity. If you have non -cons uh, if you have conserved mass, which is our case here because these species are conserved, uh, then it's not KPZ. It has a different. It actually has odd. Um, powers of the wavelength, right? Where KPZ has even ones. It's just a Laplacian and, uh, and a grad phase and a grad H squared. Um, so it's not exactly the same here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And so then the next question, next questions are from Eric Dufresne. And Eric is asking, uh, the first question is for the extensile model H, did I understand correctly that the surface tension had negative values over a finite range of length scales? If that's true, I would have expected the activity to stabilize the domains at a certain length scale. Why do the domains completely dissolve? Uh, the with active model H, they don't dissolve. And that was the point of this plot here. To make them completely dissolve, you have to just take the system about the critical temperature. For active model H, there is, I have, it looks like this. And that's, uh, that's actually what happens, yeah. So there seems to be a, uh, so this this image on the right here is what the dynamic state of the extensile active model H looks like. And uh, yeah, indeed, there is a length scale at which the system remains phase separated. That's why to get complete mi complete mixing, we have to add this, we have to add this pneumatic order parameter that keeps creating uh, um, shear flows for any density. But yeah, for, for active model H in the extensile case, then the interface tension is only negative for a finite range of wave vectors. And so for, yeah, for, for wave vectors above the one that crosses zero, it, it remains phase separated as the image here, yeah. All right, and then Eric's second question is, how do you rule out a wetting transition on the microtubule? To explain you that in the image, sorry, just to explain mm -hmm. what I meant yeah. by that in that image when you were trying to, that experimental image, it didn't look mixed to me. It looked like the the blue stuff. This one? was very heterogeneous and spray. Yeah, and that one, is that supposed to be mixed? No, this is not mixed. No, no. This uh, is fake. Ah, uh, uh, okay. So, uh, yeah, so this is... Uh, uh, this is not from my presentation, so this is a video from Alex. If this was a video, what you would see is a very turbulent flow here mm -hmm. that drives this to be completely uniform. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but in this state, this is what you would what she would say is phase separated. So this is below the critical temperature for the green region here. Okay, I understand. And um, okay, but uh, could it just be wetting though? Because as you add tons of kinesin, you're increasing the adhesive energy between the droplet and the microtubules, and you go from non-wetting to partially wetting to completely wetting. Um, maybe, yeah, I, I don't think I know enough about it to, to say anything smart. It, it could be, yeah, I, I, I actually don't know how much kinesin you have to get to get a, a specific shift of the critical temperature, but mm -hmm. yeah, that, that could be possible. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you for the comment. Yeah. Thank you. And then we have one more question uh, for you, Fernando. This is from Yotsna Lal, and they're asking, what is the kinetics of such a phase separation? Um, could they specify a bit more? Uh, like in uh, viscoelastic phase separation, um, you have uh, uh, a kind of a constant phase in the beginning constant kinetics and then later on there is some uh, change of exponents uh, I I mean is it like a general kind of viscoelastic phase separation you're seeing uh, then will it will follow the same kinetics as um, you know the work of Hajami Tanaka on this I don't know um, no the the, the comment that I can make is, well, we haven't looked at the transition itself because what we were trying to see is just if there is a shift. So, I mean, the data that we have so far for the uh, phase diagram is, is not even that good yet. Um, in terms of exponents and what happens around here, I don't really know. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know if it changes from the passive one. Uh, I don't know. Also, the, the, the system is not viscoelastic. Uh, okay. So not having elasticity is a simplification. We chose to have just to find a minimal model um, for the shift of the critical point. Um, but yeah, this is not viscoelastic. It's just okay. it's, it's just a viscous fluid. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. So 